Well, we are in a series where we're talking about how we can grow in our ability to hear from God better. Like the goal being to grow into a conversational relationship with him. And last week we started with this question, does God still speak? And we saw that, you know, in the Bible from really page one throughout, God speaks to his people. He communicates and he continues to speak after the Bible that through the millennia around the world that saints and ordinary believers through the ages have testified to hearing God's voice, to being in regular communion and regular communication with God. And so I submit to you that God still speaks today. That it's not just like a Bible times phenomenon. It's not just for spiritual leaders or saints. That these are all just examples of the kind of life that God intends for all of us. And so this invitation is always before us to know God and he us and to hear from him. Which of course makes sense since all personal close relationships are based on personal communication and interaction. Well, we ended last week with an important follow-up question. Would you like God to speak to you? Now, if we could just set aside for a moment our questions about how this works. If we could maybe set aside some of our, our doubts or our fears and, you know, ways this can get weird and wacky and distorted and misused by people. If we could also, maybe most importantly, set aside our fear of if we say yes to this, what if... I'm disappointed. What if God, you know, doesn't speak to me and then I'm kind of left what's, wondering what's wrong with me? The question is, would you like to experience this? Would you like to grow into a more conversational relationship with God? Now, before we can get to how God communicates in terms of the means or the method that God uses to speak, that's next week. You don't want to miss that. I want to come back to a quote that I shared last week by Dallas Willard. He says, our failure to hear God has its deepest roots in a failure to understand, accept, and grow into a conversational relationship with God, the sort of relationship suited to friends who are mature personalities in a shared enterprise, no matter how different they may be in other respects. That hearing God and growing into this conversation, it actually looks a lot like friends who are like mature people in a shared enterprise. Now, you may have no idea what that means, and that's okay. And I'll admit that, you know, mature personalities, in a, that doesn't sound particularly, you know, exciting. But as we're going to see, this is often not how we think about hearing God. That we actually have some misconceptions that lead to a whole lot of frustration and that are actually pretty self-defeating, and I hope to clear this up. So, what does a mature relationship with God look like? Obviously, we are not equals with God, and so what does a shared enterprise with God look like? So this is really the key, that phrase. It's the key to better grasping, first, the kinds of things we should expect God to actually speak to us about in the first place, and even more elusive to us, it's the key to better understanding what God's will is for each uh, one of our lives. So, with that, uh, Matthew 25, if you want to turn there or turn that on or however, uh, Jesus tells a really fascinating parable about this that has all kinds of, I mean, kind of wild implications for us in this area, and I don't think we take them nearly seriously enough. Matthew 25, verse 14, Jesus says, Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. 
His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Now, Notice in this parable, the people that the master entrusts this gold or these resources to, uh, notice the master doesn't give him a whole lot of specific instructions. That's clear, right? He just leaves, leaves them the money, and seems to expect them to do something with it while he's gone. They're supposed to act. They're supposed to make decisions based on who they know the master to be and what they know the master to be about. But can you see how within that they have lots of options? It's kind of wide open. And they're free to use their creativity. He empowers them to make their own decisions. In other words, it's less about specifically what they do and more about the ethos, the spirit, that guides them to do whatever it is they end up doing. And so the guy with five bags, he takes that, he invests it. We don't know how. We wish we knew, you knew how to get a 500% return, but he doesn't say that. And so does the one with two bags. And the master, when he returns and sees their initiative, the master is overjoyed. They acted on their own accord. Essentially, they took initiative guided by their general understanding of what was important to the master. And this is really the key to the parable. It's not that they got the results they got that mattered. It's that they got him right. And so the master, overjoyed by this, he invites them to share in his happiness. But the guy with one bag, fearing he was going to lose it, he buries it in the ground. And his defense seems to be, master, look, I did exactly what you said. I followed your directions, and I didn't mess up, and isn't that so great? And the master says, wrong answer. That's not what I'm looking for. I entrusted these resources to you, that you, knowing who I am, you actually had lots of freedom to act, to be creative, to take initiative with that, within those lines, but you didn't. Again, Dramatic 500% returns aren't the point because the master says you could have at least put it in the bank and earned a little interest and that would have been just as acceptable. Who do you think I am? What do you think I'm about? Now this may seem kind of strange, but here's what I think Jesus is getting at. Doing the will of God involves more than simply following orders, following directions, or carrying out orders. Believe it or not, God is not looking for like mindless foot soldiers who are just waiting for him to spell everything out all the time. Yes, doing God's will includes doing what he wants us to do, but it's way bigger than that. This means that you can be solidly in the will of God and even have the confidence of like, I'm right where I need to be without knowing God's preference surrounding all kinds of various details of our lives. It's possible to be in God's will, again, in lots of ways, to do lots of things without knowing that God prefers, prefers these actions to like these other possibilities over here. A couple of caveats, obviously. Now, we can't not do we can't not do what God commands us to do and still be in his will. Do you see how that makes no sense? Yes. And 
Even when we're not given like new specific directions, there's lots of ways of living that are not in God's will. I'm thinking of the commands in scripture, the ways God has already spoken. God may not give me new directions about how to respond to an enemy in my life in this particular situation, but he doesn't have to speak for me to know that God's will is not for me to like murder the person because God has already spoken about that. But here's what we sometimes miss. Even if you do all the things God explicitly commands and wants you to do, you might still not be the person that God would have you to be. It's possible that like an obsession with doing all of God's commands or all that God commands, that that actually at times gets in the way of being the person God's calling you to be. In other words, Doing the will of God involves not just doing what he wants us to do. It's connected to our whole life. The question of who God wants us to be is also part of God's will. God is not looking for robots. He's not looking for like puppets on his string. Now the problem is a lot of us approach God and his will just like this guy with the one bag of gold in the parable. And we just assume Doing God's will just means following directions. And so, when we lack specific direction, when we're not sure what to do, what do we do? We get paralyzed, right? Out of fear of making the wrong decision and then therefore missing God's whole will for my life is ruined, right? Again, what if his will for us is bigger than simply following directions like robots, By the way, if you think of it that way, which I would call that a misconception, the more you think about it, the more it falls apart very quickly. Uh, If you were just to put on a graph, you know, how do we know God's will for our lives and we were to think about our decisions, like on a continuum, and toward the right you have like big, important life decisions, so questions of who to marry and career choices and financial commitments that are really big or what to major in, uh, these kinds of things. We desperately don't want to make the wrong decision because we don't want to miss this. And besides, we don't want to face consequences that are bad. We don't want to face regrets. And so the bigger the decision, often the higher the stakes, usually with this is more and more uncertainty about the future that's tied to that decision the more interested we are in knowing God's will. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, God, uh, I'm way over here. Speak to me. Guide me. I need your help. I don't want to mess this up. On the other end of the continuum, uh, these would be trivial, unimportant, low stakes, uh, just kind of everyday decisions we make all the time. Now, tell me if this isn't true. The farther that you move this way, the less interested we are in hearing God's will for us in a lot of ways. None of you this morning got up and said, dear Lord, what do you want me to wear today? Because probably not, right? You don't like typically ask God to, you know, which route should I drive to the store? I mean, way over here, I've never heard anyone say, God told me today when I was showering to hold the bar of soap with three fingers, and if I dropped it, that's it. Shower's over for the day. Okay, that was a little ridiculous. I'm just showing you that we make countless decisions all the time without fear of getting it wrong, without that fear paralyzing you in the decision. Somewhere along this continuum... As the decision gets bigger, as the consequences go up, as the uncertainty increases, we cross a line, and all of a sudden, we kind of want to know what God's will for us is. Now, that's very understandable, but it's also pretty revealing. Just like the guy in the parable who buried his one talent or bag of gold in the ground out of fear, we all, to some degree, share in this general sort of human anxiety about the future. And that's normal. And naturally, we want to ask God about these events to come, and and that's not a bad impulse. My question is, what's motivating this? For a lot of us, when this happens, what's motivating our desire to know God's will is actually 
We want comfort. We want security. We want to lock these things in. We're primarily thinking about ourselves, and all of a sudden, when it pertains to our own kingdom, we want to lock in our preferred future, our own interest. So I'm just trying to show you this means it's possible to be consumed with knowing God's will for my life. Doesn't that sound holy? Doesn't that sound righteous? When in fact, do you know what we're doing? We're ignoring Jesus' warning that those who want to save their life will lose it. In other words, my extreme preoccupation with knowing God's will may simply reveal, contrary to what is often thought, that I'm overly concerned with myself. I'm not at all thinking about a Christ-like interest in the well-being of others and like the glory of God hasn't crossed my mind once in the whole interaction. By the way, I do believe God wants to guide us in our decisions, and there's a lot of scripture in that, and we can and we should ask God to speak in these moments, and we're gonna talk about it next week. But what I'm trying to show you is that doing the will of God, hearing him speak in your life, that has to include more than simply downloading the right instructions. Without realizing we can have the wrong motive for wanting to know his will, often so that we can gain. So to take hearing God seriously, we've got to get rid of, we just have to kind of let this go, all the tricks and all of the formulas for finding out what he wants, that God is not an ATM, he's not a vending machine, the Bible is not a crystal ball, And we cannot reduce hearing God to just a device that we use to make sure that we're right and that our future works out. That's important because if you start with the wrong motive to hear from God, if you begin with the wrong assumptions about what God wants to speak about in the first place, uh, you're going to be very frustrated. Worse, We don't hear God speak because we're asking the wrong questions and we end up internalizing it going, I guess God doesn't want to speak to me. And before we know it, we abandon the possibility of an interactive, communicating relationship with God. So what else might God be looking for in communicating? We know he speaks. What's he want to say? Uh, E. Stanley Jones, I, I really love this. He says, Obviously, God must guide us in a way that will develop spontaneity in us. And this is a key sentence. The development of character, rather than direction in this, that, and the other matter, must be the primary purpose of the Father. I want to know the future, right? I want to know what, right now, what stocks should I invest in that are, you know? He will guide us, but he won't override us. That fact should make us use with caution the method of sitting down with a pencil and a blank sheet of paper to write down the instructions dictated by God for the day. Suppose a parent would dictate to the child minutely everything he is to do during the day. The child would be stunted under that regime. I'm trying to imagine my kids coming to me and saying, Father, would it be your will that I should play in my bedroom or in the backyard? I'd be like... What? My kids are completely in my will, whether they're playing in the backyard or they're getting a snack in the kitchen. I frankly wouldn't want them to be unable of making a decision unless they got, you know, each and every explicit command from me for the day. Here's his conclusion. The parent must guide in such a manner and to the degree, sometimes more, sometimes less, that autonomous character capable of making right decisions for itself, is produced. God does the same. Isn't that awesome? Those of us here who are parents, I mean, you think about this. The older and the more mature our kids get, the more likely we are to respond. They come to us and they say, Mom, Dad, what, what do you want me to do? What should I do concerning this or that? The more likely, the older they get, the more likely we're to respond with what? What do you think you should do? Because we want them to develop character and make good decisions on their own. We're actually, we're actually raising adults, not children. 
Spiritually speaking, this is what God does with us. Besides, you, you just step back. In all close personal relationships, conformity to another person's wishes is not the point. I mean, can you imagine if your spouse or significant other said to you, I don't have any of my own desires. I don't want to make any decisions. I just want to mindlessly fulfill your every wish. I mean, first of all, on the one hand, no, it would be, <laughs> it would be terrible. It would be, first of all, annoying, and it would be disturbing, not to mention boring. You, you wouldn't want conformity to your, I'm sure, you wouldn't want conformity to your wishes if it came at the expense of freedom or the destruction of the person's individuality. It's the same with God and the way that he communicates with us. Genuine relationship with God or anyone else leaves room for the other person's will and initiative. There's room for what they want. Our individual initiatives, our agency, that's a central part, not, not all of it, but a central part of God's will for us. What, what I'm saying with all this is I think God is way less interested in giving us, you know, each and every specific detailed command or order or instruction. And far more interested in developing us into the kinds of people who are capable of acting within his will. Who are maturing to become more like him and have a better and better understanding of what he's generally about. Again, the parable of the talents or the gold the five bag of gold guy and the two bags of gold guy, they were praised for what? They were praised, if you read it closely, not for the results or the success they got. They were praised for taking initiative, for acting with their own brains and creativity and agency in line, of course, with what they knew of the master and his general wishes. But they didn't have to wait to be told what to do. Contrast that with the one bag of gold guy who had the wrong view of God. He comes to God and says, look at me. I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't mess anything up. But in doing no wrong, he did the biggest wrong of all. By not taking initiative, by not taking part in what the master was doing. In the same way, do you realize we demean God when we cast him in the role of like the cosmic boss or foreman? As if his chief joy in relation to humans is ordering us around, taking pleasure in seeing us jump at his command and then painstakingly, painstakingly noting our failures. God says to us, who do you think I am? See, I think this is what Willard is getting at when he talks about this conversational relationship marked by mature personalities in a shared enterprise. I mean, remember, Jesus says, Jesus says, I have called you friends. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 3, 9 says, for we are co-workers in God's service. God could have created like robot world. But in robot world, there would be no conversations, would there? There would be direction, and then there would be conformity. But that picture it robs people of the joy and the freedom that comes with true friendship, cooperative creativity. Now, is there subordination to God? Are we under? Yes, but subordination is different than forceful direction that leaves no possibility of initiative on our part. We are called into loving fellowship with the king. As Willard says, generally... We are in God's will whenever we are leading the kind of life he wants for us. In other words, learning to hear God's voice only makes sense when it's set within a larger, like, whole life. You can't detach this topic of hearing God and just use it or just approach this to guarantee or to better increase our odds of successful outcome. God speaking to us is meant to develop us into intelligent, freely, this freely cooperative relationship with him between mature people who love each other. 
When we love people, yes, we want to please them. But not to avoid trouble, not to gain favor. It's our way of being with them, sharing their life, sharing their person. Our goal is not just to hear God's voice, but to be mature people in a loving relationship with him. Now, here is what this means for our ability to hear from God. Yes, God still speaks. God desires to speak with you and me. But he actually has certain things that he's primarily interested in speaking to us about. And this is what I hope you take away from this. Throughout the Bible, and I'm sure there are exceptions, but throughout Scripture, when God speaks to people, it's almost always for two specific reasons. First, God speaks to help us develop our identity and our character. The first time that God speaks to Jesus in the Gospels, and as far as we know, the only time he speaks with an apparently audible voice was at Jesus' baptism. And it was to say, you are my son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. This is before Jesus began his ministry. He hasn't done anything. Does God have some specific things he wants Jesus to do? Yes. Yes, he does. But to me, this reads like God saying, look, look, we'll get to that. Before we get to the what's and the when's and the how's and the where's and all of that, I just want you to know you're my son and I love you. And if you know that, everything else is going to fall into place. It's interesting because, you know, after this moment, Jesus is interacting with the disciples. They're the ones going, is it now? Is it time? What's next? What if we don't do this? We need, you know... Jesus seems to be the only one in the Gospels who's not stressed out and anxious over knowing God's will for his life. He's totally relaxed, at ease. Most conversation between God and human beings is to help us understand things. He relates to us to help us develop identity, character. He wants us to become more like him, loving, wise, discerning people capable of goodness and integrity. This is why God never speaks to anyone in the Bible to tell them winning lottery numbers. It's not what he's interested in. All that to say, when we come to God asking about our future, mostly because we're facing a big decision that has high consequences and whatever, we don't want to mess up. The reason that God doesn't speak a lot of times or he doesn't speak the way that we want him to is because he's not interested in giving us exact instructions that take away our need for faith or dependence on him. He's interested in seeing us become the kinds of mature, developed people, fully capable of making decisions that honor him. Turns out, there are often multiple ways of doing that. Turns out, God honors our freedom. Again, for any parent... That's our goal for our kids, right? That they would have confidence in who they are, that they'd have the character to make wise decisions to act with integrity. I'm not interested so much in the specifics of what's your will for me as I am in who they become. We want to hear God because we want to become more like him. The goal is that we would love him with all of our being. The second primary reason God speaks is to guide us in our partnership and what God's doing in the world. I mean, this is what prayer is in a lot of ways. It's an honest exchange between two people who are doing stuff together. God and I work together, and I need his presence and his power in that activity. But it's joint activity that helps us understand how the conversation flows. Again, This comes out of our growing character. I don't believe that God delights in constantly telling us how everything he wants us to do. I don't think, rather, I think he enjoys it when we understand who he is and his will and we act on that. And it's like God goes, they get me. Here's an example. Think about the new person at work, right? Isn't it nice when the new person can finally do the job and like act 
in line with what you're doing at work without having to be told every single little thing. Doesn't everybody around that person go, there's plenty of freedom here for us to use our creativity to act in line with who we know God is and what he's about. You think about Jesus again. He often gets away to pray, to listen to God. He's not downloading his instructions for the day. What's he doing? He's listening. He's open to God. He's trying to better grasp, generally speaking, what God is up to around him. And so, for example, when Jesus goes into the synagogue and the man with the messed up hand shows up, Jesus asks the religious leaders, what's the lawful thing to do? To do good, meaning to heal the man, or to do evil, to leave him in his distress? What should I do? And then he's silent. And then they're silent because they have no idea what God wants or what to do next. Jesus knew what God wanted done in each and every case because he generally knew, or he knew generally, the mind of God. So throughout scripture, God communicates most specifically with people who are ready and willing to be in business with him. Friends, and co-workers with him. Is this on our radar screen at all? Is this any of our motivation to hear from God? I mean, how often do we think to ask God what he's doing around us and how we can participate in that? And so, for those of you who would say, yes, I'd like God to speak. I would like to hear from God more in my life. It starts by coming to God with the right posture. It starts by putting ourselves in a better position to hear what God's saying in the first place. It begins with asking the right questions. And so if you're taking notes, I have a challenge for you this week. I want to get very specific and ask you to consider this. I want to challenge you that every day this week, so for the next seven days, that you would begin your day with seven minutes. Why seven minutes? Because I just said seven days. <laughs> and I will, I, it would be, it's going to make a lot more sense to do this in the morning because you'll see here in a second. So for the next seven days, just consider this. Imagine yourself doing this right now. You're going to get up and you're going to get your coffee or whatever it is you need to do. And you're going to find a quiet place, and you're going to get quiet and still. You're going to put your phone away, except for maybe to set a seven-minute timer. And then you're going to ask, before God, two very specific questions that get to this and this. The first question, God, what do you want to say about who I am and who I'm becoming? God, I am surrounded by all kinds of other voices that are influencing me, telling me who I am or they think I should be or whatever it is. I got all these voices in my head. Who do you say that I am and who I'm becoming? I want to hear your voice. And I'm just telling you, to hear God speak, not out loud, but in the the stillness of our hearts and minds, to hear him say to you, you are my daughter, you are my son. I love you. I am Please with you. You can take your anger, you can take your anxiety, you can take your frustration, and everything else takes its place beneath that. It reframes everything. Secondly, who am I becoming? Um, here's just a, a little exercise you could do. If you were just to take on a note card and write down Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, known as the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22, and 23. Just to write those on a note card. By the way, this is God's will for your life. (laughs) God, in light of who I am and who you want me to become, just have a question. Do I need to grow? (laughs) How do I need to grow in these areas? Is there one particular area right now you want me just to focus on? And just listen. And I'm sitting there and I'm listening and I hear God speak, you know, again, internally. You really lost your patience with your kids last night. (laughs) And the word patience just kind of sticks out of like, oh yeah, I probably need to go and apologize 
and think about, you know, or God, why in this or that area do I seem to lack self-control? What is that about? And just listen. Who am I and who I'm becoming? And then the second question, and you should have three and a half minutes. And this is a question very few, few of us ask. Father, what do you want to do together? When's the last time you prayed that? And just listen to what he says. And again, it may be uh, someone you're supposed to reach out to, maybe a way to serve at something at work. God, how are you at work around me? This is what Jesus is doing in his solitude and his silence. What are you doing around me? How is your kingdom expanding and growing, and, and how do you want me to play a part of that? And just listen, maybe God puts one or two things on your heart for the day. If nothing else, you will go through that day more likely to, be in, to have an open posture, more likely to be kind of in tune to opportunity. Hey, here's a chance for me to encourage someone. I wasn't really thinking about that, but now that I'm thinking about this, I can invite this person to church. I can pray for this person or whatever it is. So those are the two challenges, the two questions, that, rather. These are questions that God, these are the right kinds of questions that God delights in speaking to us about. A couple of little tips. You don't have to force anything to happen. You don't have to like force some magical dramatic moment. Just let it be what it is. You, you may have a day or two or three and the seven minutes feels like an eternity and the alarm goes off and nothing seemed to have happened. But at least we're asking the right questions and I actually believe you're gonna be pleasantly surprised. At least we're asking questions that God is interested in answering. So come back seven days from now after 49 minutes of doing this and just be ready for where we're going next week. And I think the degree to which you engage with this and uh, let me just say one more thing, sorry. For those of us who say we would like God to speak, I know that's gonna sound maybe heavy handed. For those of us who say we would like God to speak but then aren't willing to take seven minutes for seven days Maybe you've got a different way of doing this and you've got your own system or whatever, but if we're unwilling to do that, at the very least, I think we have to ask ourselves some honest questions about how badly we want to hear. Is that fair? All right, so come back next week and uh, we'll be ready to go. Would you stand and we'll pray. Lord, I just pray for each person here um, who maybe for a second or two considered putting this into practice and then are on to the next thing. Lord, help us just to have the desire and the discipline to carve out a few minutes uh, this week to listen. To kind of set aside our expectations and our list of things and how we want this to work and to come to you hopefully more on your terms, willing to listen and engage with what you're interested in. Lord, I pray for each person here that, that practices this, that in the midst of the stillness and the mind wandering and the boredom, that you would speak in some very clear ways that we would hear you say about us that we are your son, we are your daughter, and that you love us. That you would point out some key ways you're wanting to develop our character and that you'd show us some ways we can partner with you today, tomorrow, and the next day. May you receive the glory and may we experience the joy of cooperating creatively with you in your work. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week, and uh, we'll see you next time.